Good morning. Hola, buenos dias. My Spanish is very little, so I will be standing in front of the microphone while my lovely translator will help us through this session. Um, I'm very excited to see so many people here this morning. It's a bit overwhelming, I can say. And you came out in the rain, so that's very good. Um, how many people in the room, just so that I can get an idea, are, are academics? How many here are academics? Most of you. How many are journalists or from the media? A few. And government policy makers, a few. And then how many of you are just random strangers who happen to come by the hotel and think, oh, that looks really interesting. I think I'll go in. No one? Oh, well. You're all welcome anyway. I'm glad to see you. Thank you. So thank you, Rosa, for that nice uh, introduction. Uh, gave a little bit of background on myself, but I will give you a little more insight, and I call it how I got to Peru in five easy steps, okay? So uh, even though I live in London, I am American, and I was born and raised in a small town uh, in Oklahoma. Any ever, anybody ever been to Oklahoma before? Yay, three people, you know, wonderful. And um, so I was born and raised in Oklahoma and got my first degree there. And then I moved to Los Angeles where I had got my master's in acting. And I lived in Los Angeles for about eight years and did film and television. And then I decided that I really wanted to have a more international experience. So I moved to Britain and got into a PhD program in Brighton. And when I moved to Brighton, I thought, oh, it's like Venice Beach, but with English accents. And uh, it was not so much. Uh, it was very cold. The beach was very rocky. And uh, there wasn't much of a summer. But um, I did my PhD there in media and film. And uh, then I got my postdoc at the University of Hertfordshire, where I did a research fellow in the creative economy uh, research center. And last year was the end of that contract. Last year was a big year uh, because the end of the contract for the postdoc, I had met the love of my life, who we were not yet married, and I had no job. <laughs> and I was going to be kicked out of the country. And uh, so I had a colleague of mine who had told me about the British Council Research Connect program, which had just launched that year. I had no idea what it was. I just said, I'll sign up for it. I just need a job. I'll take it. And uh, little did I know that this amazing program, this British Council Research uh, Connect program, would change my life. And not only change my life, but impact the lives of everybody that I have met in all of the countries that I have now traveled to since I started with British, Con uh, British Council last year. Um, I am now doing consulting full time and facilitating the training with the British Council. And um, the experiences that I have uh, could fill a book. And my husband keeps telling me to write a book. So I think I, that will be the next creative project. Um, but I just wanted to, to share some, um, some pictures with you um, just so, so I can show you how, how wonderful this project has been. Um, some of the pictures are quite small. Hopefully they will. But the, the travels that I've been able to do while we're getting the pictures up, my very first job was in Kazakhstan. How many of you have been to Kazakhstan? Nobody. I, didn't, I had to look and see where Kazakhstan was on the map. So, uh, but it was a wonderful first opportunity for me to travel. There we go. This is actually in Alexandria in Egypt. So I have traveled to Egypt quite a few times. I've been to China. Uh, I went to Myanmar earlier this year, which is uh, formerly Burma. Um, I've been to Brazil several times, um, and these are just some of the uh, pictures I wanted to show you. This is, uh, like I said, in Alexandria. Uh, this is in Cairo. This was my uh, little trip in Myanmar, where the girls were selling the flowers. Uh, usually my trips uh, usually contain a three-day workshop, two days of free time, and three days off. So these are some of the things I get to do when I go and travel to these countries as well. So this was in Myanmar. I got to go to, this is one of my bucket lists, and I got to actually go ride a camel in the middle of the desert uh, when I was in Cairo on one of my days off. And this was in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
which uh, this was Sunday, so they closed off Avenida Paulista and everybody was biking, and I thought that was a really wonderful uh, trip. This is in Shenzhen. This is uh, up north in China, around Beijing. This was one of my first trips ever to China. Uh, just one of the temples in the, the local area in Beijing. This was my first, uh, my first workshop in Kazakhstan. This is the view from the hotel in Kazakhstan. You see all the mountains with the, um, with the snow on them, which was quite amazing. This was in Campinas, which is outside of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Again, Alexandria, another, another workshop I did there. More pyramids. <laughs> Mandalay, I love these pictures. Mandalay is a wonderful city. It's very remote, and uh, they were just changing governments. Uh, democratic government was getting ready to come on board. So everything in Mandalay hasn't changed in 50 years. People are still riding around on motorcycles and it's really beautiful to see all of the colors and the people. And of course, another workshop in Mandalay. This was one of the pagodas that was in Mandalay. The monks, the, these were the kids in training, the children in training. And these were all just taken with my uh, my phone. This was in the Amazon. That was another bucket list. So I got to go swim in the Amazon with the dolphins on one of my days off and got to see the Rio Negro. This is from Alexandria. This was from my hotel as the sun was setting. Uh, one of my students in Egypt who wishes me to come back to Egypt, which I thought was lovely. Alexandria, I got to talk with uh, some of the local professors as well who are very interested in the work that British Council is doing. So not only do I get an opportunity to train the, the participants, but I get to interact with the local faculty depending upon which university is hosting the, the workshop at that time. So I get to see the work that they're doing and also help expand their program. And then, of course, this is my hotel view from Lima. This is as far as I've gotten since I've been here because I uh, have successfully delivered the, the first workshop. We did our first workshop finished yesterday, and uh, it was three days of a lot of fun, and uh, the workshop participants were great. And we have two uh, workshops left to go before I get on a plane, jump back home, and then jet off to China again three weeks later. So those are just a couple of pictures I wanted to show just to give you an idea of, of how the, the program works. Because like I said, it, it doesn't just impact um, the, the participants' lives, but it also impacts mine as well. Because I learn and grow just as much as the participants do. OK? So I'm going to go to our PowerPoints. So what I want to do now is I want to just give you an idea of some of the um, things that I cover during the workshops. I was told that, that you were really interested in some of the tips and some of the content that I share in the workshop. The workshop itself has seven modules uh, so far. Uh, I've just co-written a social media for researchers module which we will be testing in the marketplace and uh, will be part of the British Council Researcher Connect program very, very soon. So in our, in our first module that we do, it's called the foundation module. And the foundation module really is the fundamental premise that underlies all of the core modules that we do. And it gives the participants a really great idea on what they can expect um, but also, what are their expectations? What is it that they want to learn? And so we started off with a little game of cards, and we have the, the workshop participants answer all of these questions, why they think it's important for researchers to connect. Um, why do uh, so many academic proposals fail to achieve funding? And, um, and, and then, of course, what are the consequences of ineffective collaboration? One of the premier uh, important things of the Researcher Connect program is interdisciplinary and also collaboration. Because particularly in the UK and the EU, uh, research uh, is looking for impact, interdisciplinary impact. And most all research funding uh, grants now have to have an impact statement in them. 
So the Researcher Connect program really emphasizes building these bridges and helping the participants to be global ready, to be able to make sure that their research is um, heard outside of the borders of their own country. So I use, for example, Brazil has about 16,000 scientific journals. If the participants or the, the, the academic only uh, produces research in Portuguese, they cannot republish it in an English language journal. So then the research only stays in Brazil. And the problem with that is, is that I go to Myanmar and they have the exact same problems. Waste, pollution, overpopulation, food shortages, the same things, the same problems that all these countries are facing. And the wonderful thing about this program is that it establishes a, a, a mainframe in which everybody can sort of have similar context and then use that context in order to collaborate. So how can someone in Brazil and Myanmar connect and share ideas and come up with new solutions to old world problems? And so that's what Researcher Connect is all about. And it also helps to establish better English language skill, uh, better presentation skills, and also more confidence so that you as an academic feel more confident to be able to apply for conferences abroad, to submit for academic journals in English, and to find new collaborators outside of your key circles. The course, uh, the, the, the purpose of this particular aim, again, is to look at the appropriate style that is needed to meet your audience and also to make sure that your, your writing is clearer and more concise. So three, th three key things that we cover in the beginning of this module is what is your purpose for writing? So when we sit down and we think about what we're going to write for a proposal or it's an abstract for a conference or an abstract even to submit to a journal article, we don't really stop and think, what is the reason I'm doing this other than somebody has told me I need to publish or I need to put a proposal in, right? And so by understanding what our purpose for writing is, we establish a really smart focus point that we can refer to. And that purpose is whether it's I want to write an abstract to submit to a journal article so that I can be published internationally or I want to go to an international conference. And that's sort of the surface purpose. But the deeper purpose is that if you're, say, submitting an abstract to a conference, yes, you want to get it accepted to a conference, but the deeper purpose is that you want to be able to disseminate, disseminate your research to a wider audience, to put you in a position to where you can collaborate or gain more visibility for your research outside of your country. And once you identify what those core things are, it helps you to at least start to be able to outline the presence of your paper. And then the second thing we look at is the audience and why are they so important? Most of the time, academics do not think of the other. We're only thinking of ourselves. What do I have to say? What I, my research is really important and if I just tell you how brilliant it is, then you're going to give me funding. You're going to allow me to get into a conference, right? But most of the time, we don't consider the audience. And the audience should be the very first thing that we can, should consider. Because look at it this way. The most difficult thing that we do as academics is we have to take a really complex idea and simplify it so that it can be easily understood. Right? So if you're submitting your research for a grant proposal or a journal or a, an academic conference, your research could be absolutely brilliant. But if you don't communicate it, and particularly in a new language, in a way that is understood, then it's going to be discounted. And then what's the point? It could be the most brilliant research, but if nobody understands it, then it's not going to go anywhere. Right? So the British Council Researcher Connect program teaches you skills and, and trains you in a way that allows you to meet that bridge, to be able to exercise a way to have more proficient English language and also to understand cultural variances, uh, things that will help your, uh, your research be understood in the context of another culture and another language. And then finally, we talk about this critical difference. What is the critical difference? What is this acronym, W-I-I-F-M? It stands for what's in it for me, and not what's in it for me as the academic, 
but what's in it for me as the, the, re the reader or the listener? If I come to listen to you at a conference, what's in it for me? What am I going to get out of it? Let's say, for example, you have this brilliant research project and the methodology is outstanding, right? You're so excited to talk about the methodology, but it's buried in data and scientific research. And I'm here to listen to the results. I want to hear, how did you find the results of your research? You should lead with that. That's how you should start your presentation, with the results, not with the methodology. And the way that you know this is you do your research on your audience before you go to the conference. Who's there? Who's my keynote speakers? What are they interested in learning? And then you find a way to be able to disseminate your research in a way that reaches the audience more clearly. Okay, so um, that's that. And then I'll show you another couple of slides. Yep. So again, this critical difference. And when we say the critical difference in terms of how my audience is going to benefit and how will they value, this sets you apart from all of the other researchers who are competing with you for those dollars, who are competing for that spot in the conference. If you're able to find that critical difference that reaches the audience, then you're going to stand up and be ahead of the other researchers who are submitting their papers. And what I also tell my participants are that to be an effective writer or an effective speaker, you must, is my battery dying? I don't know what this means. I have a, a notice on, my, on the computer. Um, what I tell, uh, to be an effective writer or speaker, you must inform your audience about your research. You must engage them. They must be really passionate as much as you are and engage in your research. And you must persuade them to do something, whether that's funding or collaborate with you or to accept your paper for something. Okay. Okay. And then the critical difference is that you will get the audience to know something. You'll get them to feel something and get them to ultimately do something. Okay? And I'll just one second. It's frozen. I don't know. It's, it's frozen. I don't know what that means. Okay. And then the other thing we talk about in the afternoon, we look at writing skills, right? So we have these terms here on the bottom, complete, coherent, concise, courteous, correct, and clear. And then we have the, the definitions of those six C's of modern writing. And the six C's basically are how we can be more proficient in our English language and how we can write in a more, uh, a more profound way. Let me just turn to this page quickly. So if your writing is coherent, it means that it's logical, that it flows well. It's easy to read. It's easy for, for the readers to follow the paper. Concise, straight to the point. Academics are the worst when it comes to writing because we talk indirectly. We talk around and around the subject until we finally get there. But actually, being direct and to the point is a much better approach. Give the reader what they need to know, straight to the point. Clear. It's easy to understand. If you have too much technical jargon or too many technical terms that are related to your specific industry, and you're speaking to a group who are not peers or academic, they're not going to understand what it is that you're saying. If you're presenting your research to a rural village, they're not going to understand terms and concepts of your research. So you have to find a way that you can make your research easily understood. Courteous, particularly when you're writing in English. It is this polite, uh, positive language, personal tone. One of the things that I learned uh, when I went to Britain is that Britons are very different even though we speak the same language. <laughs> and I really struggled with this for my first couple of years um, because Americans, we write like we speak. It's very conversational, very matter of fact, whereas British academics is very formal and very formulated and it's, very, it's quite different. So I had to learn, even in my own language, that I had to change my style and my approach to writing. 
And then, of course, it has to be correct. Grammar, syntax, spelling, all of those things are very important, particularly when you are applying to an English language uh, um, um, conference or a paper. And then complete. It includes all of the information. All of these things are really, really important. One of the other things that we talk about is some sentence uh, some sentence rules, sentence lengths. There was a university research project that looked at the comprehension of a reading of a sentence that contained 27 words, a sentence that had 17 words, and a sentence that had seven words. So the comprehension of reading a sentence with 27 words one time, what percentage do you think people understood that sentence, high or low? Above 50% or lower? Lower? Lower than 20%? Maybe. How about 4%? 4% understood a sentence in 27 words. So all you academics out there who love to write long sentences, they're probably reading your sentences over and over again so that they can understand, what is this person saying? And what about 17%? Higher or lower than 50%? Higher than, higher than 50%? Higher than 60? Mm, yeah. Actually, 76%. So it goes up quite significantly. So if you're writing around 17 words, about 76% of your audience is going to comprehend and read uh, really well. And then what about seven words? A sentence that has seven words, how many people understood? Higher? Higher than 80? Hi, hi, 80? Higher than 90? Higher than 90, 96. It's like a bid, it's like an auction. <laughs> yep, so 96. So actually the maximum length that we recommend a sentence should be is 20. 20 words, no more. And then the average length of a sentence should be between 12 and 15. 12 and 15 words. And again, you want to have kind of a mix of these things as you're writing throughout. And then your paragraphs... There's a difference between the printed and the online because, of course, we're now, uh, uh, we're now publishing online. When you're printing something, it should only contain about eight lines for print, and then online only four because we scan the page. And remember, again, most people are only going to read your abstract. That's it. They're not going to go down the page. So your abstract has to capture their attention from the very, very beginning. It has to hook the reader. And by following some of these sentence rules and the six C's helps sort of guarantee that you're going to have a much higher readability and a much higher readership than uh, you would if you don't use it. Okay? As early as possible. And you should also consider if you have only one primary audience or a secondary audience. Sometimes when we uh, go speak at a conference, you may have a mix of peers and non-academic peers. Or you may be speaking to non-academic people as well. So it's important to know how and how knowledgeable your audience is going to be about your subject. Some ways that you can find out about who your audience is, if you're going to a conference, you can look at the delegate list. You can look at the keynote speakers before you go. You can look at key, uh, speakers or papers that had happened in the past. If you look at a journal article, you can see articles that were printed in the past or get a good idea of who reads that journal and so forth, okay? So it gives you a really good idea of how to tap into that. And then we also talk about the writer-focused versus the reader-focused. So again, academics usually think it's all about me, it's all about my research. And we think about it in a writer-focused way, which is what do I know about this topic, what do I want to say? What information should I include? What's the best way for me to say it? What do I want to say first? How should I organize the information? And what do I mean to say? But actually, that focus is wrong. We should be focusing on the reader-focused approach, which is what do they want to know? What do they want to hear first? In what order do they want to hear my information first? And we should be changing our minds and switching our mindset to that, okay? So another, um, switch this over quickly. 
So then another module that I teach is on abstracts. So after we understand the fundamentals of writing and our audience, we look at key information that should go in your abstract. Because again, this is a very important document. This is your calling card. This is your, your business card, if you will. This is what most people are going to know of you about your research, whether they're looking to cite the material or you're using the abstract to get to a conference or a journal. Now these aren't in particular order. because I usually play games with, my, uh, with uh, the, the participants, so it becomes a guessing game. Typically in abstracts, particularly geared towards uh, the UK, European, um, we have these essential elements. They're very similar to, I believe, what you, you do in your work as well, um, as I gained knowledge from my participants yesterday as well in the workshop. So the essential elements of an abstract should be the background, which the background um, uh, helps the reader to uh, understand what will be there. The aim is your aim or your objective, which answers the why. This hooks the reader. Right? So the background can also be the situation. What's happening in my industry? What are the problems? What is the solution that I'm trying to solve? The aim of my research or the objective of my research is to do X, right? So then after that, the interest and the focus, which this is the focus of my paper. This is what my, my research is going to be talking about. And then the overview of the contents gives the reader context. It gives them an extra layer of what it is that your research is specifically going to talk about. And then you have the methodology, of course. How are you going to take, uh, how are you going to undertake this research? Uh, what sort of samples are being used? What sort of resources or testing methods did you use? And then your findings are results, explains your unique contribution to research. And then the conclusion is the findings, results, and outcomes. And so we sort of look at it in that order because it flows well, it's logical, and it's what expected from the, the readers as well. So there's sort of a crazy, crazy map to show you what it is. And remember that your abstract should be written with absolute clarity because it is the one thing that they're going to be reading. It is your first foot in the door. And if it doesn't get accepted, then they're not going to go any further. And each discipline has different word lengths, um, mostly, sometimes it's anywhere between 300 and 500 words, depending on if it's a conference or a paper, sometimes it can be less. Um, usually they recommend that an abstract should be about 250 words, but whatever the word count is, you should always follow instructions. One of the key things that I try to drive home with my participants as well is that the number one reason why academics fail to achieve funding is not that their research isn't innovative enough or not that their methodology practices aren't sound or it's not interdisciplinary or it doesn't have impact. It's because academics don't follow instructions. They are very, very bad at following instructions. So you have to find a way to make your brilliant, amazing research piece fit within the confines of what the remit is asking for. If they want 10 pages, no more than 10 pages. If they want an abstract that's 400 words, no more than 400 words. And aim for no more than 90%, less than 90%, okay? So don't ever go over the word count or over the word page. If they ask for an 11 point font and a Times New Roman, give them an 11 point Times New Roman, even if it's not your favorite font, okay? So after we talk about the, um, the, what, what elements should be in an abstract, how do we actually sit down and write an abstract? Most academics will write an abstract at the end. You've done a research proposal, uh, and then you write the abstract to be submitted for dissemination after. But what if you haven't done research yet? What if you haven't undertaken the new project, but you want to talk about it at a conference or you want to find new collaborators? How would you actually put an abstract together? So we talk about two different types of forms. There's the, uh, the uh, big to small approach and the small to big. So when you start big, you've already written a research project or a proposal that's probably extremely, extremely lengthy. 
right? And even if you write an abstract at the beginning of the process, that's not going to be the abstract you're going to finish with when you finished your research. So what we ask you to do is after you've done your research and you've written the proposal or the project brief, that you go back and you basically read a paragraph or a section and you extract a main idea and write a one key sentence, a main idea from that section. Then you search through the entire document looking at key terms um, and paying particular attention to the introduction and the conclusion. And then after you've written all your key sentences from each section, then you tie those together and that is loosely your rough draft. And then you reword your abstract into shorter phrases, look at the sentence lengths, make sure you're following the six C's, make sure that all your points flow together, check your grammar and spelling, and then you write your final draft. And I also noticed from all of my travels around to these different countries is that there's a, a huge interest and very, um, you're very prominent uh, about making sure that we, we get in and get this Research or Connect program, but yet there's no support systems within the university. There's no English language training or support department within the university. Uh, finding a translator or a native English speaker in your own country is quite difficult and expensive, right? So one of the resources that I give to my participants is there's this great online company in the States. It's called Fiverr. It's F-I-V-E-R-R dot -R com. And it's anything you want for five bucks. So you can find a translator. You can find someone to proofread your abstract uh, for five bucks. And it's all socially rated. So you can find someone with lots of stars that's done a lot of uh, really good work. And uh, they could charge by the, the, the word count or by the page. But it's a really good idea that before you send it to a journal or a conference, to have a native speaker take a look at the abstract and give you a review back and then you can make adjustments and send it back. So that's starting big to small. Starting small to big is a little bit more difficult because you haven't undertaken the research yet, but there actually are ways in which uh, you can uh, put an abstract together. And so the first thing is, is, is writing down what is your one-line argument? What does your research say? It's usually your research question, right? What is the purpose of my work? Remember we went back to the, the purpose statement and we had sort of this surface statement of what it is that I'm wanting to do and why am I wanting to do this uh, abstract. And then summarize your work into a six word story. Uh, you've heard of maybe the Japanese haiku. They're really short poems, they don't necessarily rhyme, but in this context it's six keywords that are different than keywords you would put in an abstract, but that tell the story of your research. And then lastly, three keywords on what does your research do, how are you going to do it, and so what, why, who cares. And from all of that, you should be able to extract enough information to be able to start building your abstract. And that's, that's one thing that we, that we look at in that particular module. Another module that we look at is proposals. And proposals are another big aspect of our academic careers. And the aim of this course is to look at, again, structure, which is really important, and again to think about your readers in mind and, and persuasively look at how to persuade your audience in a way that they will give you money, give you collaboration. And again, we talked about this uh, challenges with funding. So the other thing that we look at is this power writing process. Everybody has a system. They have a way in which they sit down and write. Academics are notorious for being busy all the time. You're lecturing 500 students. You've got six classes a week. You have to grade. You've got administrative jobs to do. And somewhere in there, you're supposed to be doing research that you're not paid for, <laughs> right? And supposed to turn out something really brilliant at the same time and get funding and prestige for the university. It's a worldwide problem. It's not uh, just you, I promise. But we talk about a power writing process which will help you to be more proficient and more efficient in your daily lives. And so we this power process, this P-O-W-E-R, stands for 
planning, organizing, writing, editing, and reviewing. So planning. Planning allows you to be more efficient. It means less writing. If you can plan and help meet your reader's expectations from the very beginning, you could clearly have your goal in mind, you know who your audience is, what you're writing the proposal for, and are able to put together all of your key ideas in a format that's easy to read, you've got a nice sound format that you can refer to throughout the process. Because writing a proposal is not easy. It takes months and months and months, if not years sometime, to write a proposal for something. So planning is really instrumental to have a key roadmap for you to follow. The next thing is to organize your thoughts. This helps the writing flow better. It also makes it more easy to read, and it's a more positive read for your, uh, for your audience. I remember I have read so many um, academic journals where I have to refer to a dictionary every fifth word because the words are so big, and I don't understand what they're trying to say. So you need to make sure that your, your research is readable and easily understood by multiple audiences. After you organize your thoughts, then you write your first draft, and this gets your idea flowing. You're not going to have a final proposal in your first draft. And then you edit it, make sure it looks professional and easy to understand. After you edit it, I would then suggest you send it to somebody, a native speaker, somebody at Fiverr, that can review it and give you some positive feedback. And then you can write your final draft and review it and make sure that the message is clear. Okay? So that's the power of writing process. And then we also look at the sections of a proposal. Much like the sections of the abstract, uh, we have a very definitive group of, um, of sections. Now, they can be arranged somewhat in different ways, but we typically, dis we typically say that they should be a, a certain way that is accepted, particularly in the UK or in, in um, Europe. And so these are the headings. You have your executive uh, summary or your abstract, but the executive summary is actually a 50-word introduction of your paper. Um, then you've got your, uh, of course, your benefits, your methods, situation, objective, and all of these others. So then I ask my participants to put them in order, and these are the definitions. So the essential elements is the, I'm sorry, excuse me, the executive summary is the first one. And again, it's less than 50 words. The challenge, the plan, or the need is your situation. Why is your research important? What are you asking for? The request, right up front. Just ask what you're asking for. Collaboration, money, publication. What do you want to achieve? This is your aim or your objective. How do you aim to achieve your objective, which is your methodology? Why are you the best person? This is your qualifications for you or your team. What resources do you have and what are needed? These are costs, right? Uh, what will have changed as a result from your plan? This is the outcomes. What will the reader, the field, the society, and the world gain? These are your, I'm sorry, the first one was your outputs, second one was your outcomes or your benefits, and then how can they get in touch with you as contacts? And again, these can be organized in, in a different way, but this is a, a good solid model for us to follow. And then lastly, we look at the academic collaboration module. And the collaboration is quite fun because, again, it looks at taking all of the things that we've learned in the core modules and putting together a strategy that we can input into our own lives to be able to become better collaborators. Because academics, particularly scientists, sorry, scientists, but you love to just sit in your little labs and just leave me alone and let me do my own work and I'll, I'll live happily ever after. But actually we need each other. We need to be able to collaborate and build strong ties with people so that we can move our research further and our ac academic careers higher, faster, right? So for this particular module, we look at areas of collaboration. We assess your own particular network that you have now find out where the gaps are, and how we might be able to impact that by finding new collaborators. And then where do we find new collaborators? How might we find new people to fill those gaps? And we talk about successful collaboration is the ability to, to make new connections in areas where you might want to exert influence, right? 
And a lot of times people think collaboration is networking, that dirty word, networking. Oh, I hate networking. I don't like doing that. You go to a conference, and after the plenary session, everybody dumps out into a 15-minute frenzied, insane coffee break where everybody's exchanging cards, you know. But the problem is, is that if you don't follow up afterwards, it's not meaningful, and then it's forgotten. Everybody goes back to their lives, and nothing happens, right? But it should be a very instrumental and very strategic approach. You can find out who's at the conference before you go, or if there's a collaborator that you have read their research for literature review and you want to meet them, and they're a keynote, maybe they're coming to your country or to your university to speak, and you prepare to go meet them. Okay, so we talk about that. Then we look at how to plan and maintain a strategic collaboration. Most academics that I have spoken to say collaboration is usually a disaster. It's usually a disaster. But this risk can be mitigated if you follow a few key points. And that is make sure that you discuss your overall aims. What does everybody hope to gain out of this collaboration so that everybody's clear from the beginning why it's important? And then what are the specific outputs that you're hoping to get? If, you're, you know, if you have one team member that wants all of the glory but won't put in much work, it makes it really unbalanced and very difficult, right? Or if you all have expectations for outputs and they're not met, there can be a lot of disappointment uh, along the way. Also talking about key deadlines and the consequences of missing those. Every grant uh, proposal or project is going to have milestones or key, key dates that you're going to have to make. And particularly when you're working with a group of people, and it doesn't even have to be people all over the world. This can be people that you see and work with every single day. Because academics have different work schedules. Some like to write in the morning or work in the afternoon. Some only like to use email. Some like to use phone calls. And so discussing your communication schedules is also very important so that there's no misunderstanding or breakdown in communication along the way. A grant project sometimes can last two or three years. And anything that can and will happen, Murphy's Law, they say, right? So it's best to be proactive and get these things out of the way so that there's a mutual agreement or understanding at the beginning and that there's contingency built into that collaboration in case anything happens, OK? And then we look at analyzing and building your own particular network. Who do you know right now? And we do an exercise where I ask them to look at the types of relationships that they currently have. And there's six types of relationships. There's a strong relationship, weak, intrinsic, extrinsic, alike, and different. And the, the definitions are not uh, balanced with the answer. Because um, again, it's a game that we play. But the idea is to understand and evaluate that these types of relationships exist. And when you can analyze these types of relationships and who you have them with, you can see that there's actually gaps in my relationships. I have too many strong relationships. And there are cons, there are negatives to having strong relationships because you have to consider their needs. You have to care about their research when you just want to care about your own. Or you have a weak relationship, but there's also a con to that. There's a good, I mean, a pro to that is that you don't have to consider their relationship, but maybe they are very important uh, connection because of who they know or what they do. So by being able to identify all of these, then we ask them to fill it out on a networking chart, right? So take seven people that you know, that you currently know, that are in your circle of influence, and where do they fit on that chart? And then we ask them to draw a target around the edges. What do you want your networking chart to look like a year from now? Who do you want to meet? Who, who might help to influence your needs? And we define what those needs are early on. And then finally, we look at how can we find potential collaborators? Where, how, and, and when? And different places that we can find potential collaborators are, of course, at conferences. We can find them online in academic blogs or academic threads. Um, we can find them at departmental meetings or other academic events. How can we find them? 
Maybe you can uh, volunteer yourself to be an external reviewer, go to another university to put yourself in a position to be seen and meet new people. Maybe you can start a new grad conference, lead a grad conference or an academic event where you invite keynote speakers. I had a colleague of mine, um, she was in the uh, School of Humanities and she worked with a nursing student and they decided they wanted to start a conference, but they didn't have much money. They got the approval of their department to do it, but they were only going to uh, announce it on online. They were only going to have a blog page, and they were going to have a Twitter, and that's how they were going to announce the conference. It was going to be one day with three keynote speakers, and they thought maybe 60 people would show up. It ended up being 60 keynote speakers, three days, and 400 people showing up and it became larger than life. But what happened was, from those beginning stages, they then became the go-to people, and everybody wanted to collaborate with them on a project. And they ended up creating a published magazine from the conference. They ended up running it again the second year. They had several journal articles co-authored that came out of it, and then some new research program, uh, projects that they are working with for some of the delegates that came to the conference. So. There's many different places that you can put yourself in a position to meet new collaborators. And then finally, when to find them. There's three stages where you can find them. Set the people stage, number one. So you have people, colleagues that you work with, that you like, that you work very well with. And this is a great beginning to a collaboration. The problem with that is that sometimes you may not find a mutually beneficial research project. But that's one stage. The second stage is at the um, proposal stage, right? So you have a really great idea for a proposal. Now you need to go seek out skills and attributes of somebody else, a potential collaborator, that can help you do that proposal, right? But the problem is that you may not be able to find funding to support that research proposal. And then the last stage is actually at a, a, a grant, a funding opportunity which is really exciting because as academics we run to the money whenever it comes up. We're like beakers. Oh, there's money I'm going to supply. Oh, there's, there's money I'm going to apply. But it's actually not a good strategy because it, if, you, if you want to apply to a grant, now you have to find skills and attributes to help collaborate on that project. It may be misguided or misdirected and you may take anybody on just so that you can get your proposal in the door. But those are three different ways and uh, three different stages in which collaboration can happen as well. But ultimately, what we say, what, what I try to, to um, impart upon my uh, participants is that you must have a strategy. Because it's not enough to just submit and hope that you get published or submit and hope you get into a conference. It should actually be very strategic along the way and not just submit to, to anything and everything. And then finally, the other modules that we have, uh, which I'm not teaching here in Peru this time, but um, is effective emails. Uh, effective emails is really popular in China. Uh, they're really, uh, they want to know how to have the correct protocol in order to get into the door, whether that's to do a PhD uh, in the UK or to get a postdoc or to write a letter uh, that's going to support their abstract submission. Um, the other one that we do is called Presenting with Impact. And this is a really fun module because academics don't necessarily get the training that they need uh, when it comes to uh, presenting. And it's such an important part of your job, really, particularly if you're going to be speaking at conferences. So I have a little video prepared that we'll watch a few minutes of. Everybody familiar with uh, TEDx? I've heard of TEDx. TEDx is a brilliant uh, repository of videos, particularly for academic subjects, where you can find all kinds of interesting stuff. So we'll watch this video just for a minute. So I want to start by um, offering you a free no-tech life hack. Um, and all it requires of you is this, that you change your posture for two minutes. 
But before I give it away, I want to ask you to right now do a little audit of your body and what you're doing with your body. So how many of you are sort of making yourselves smaller? Maybe you're hunching,、um, crossing your legs, maybe wrapping your ankles. Sometimes we hold on to our arms like this.、Uh, sometimes we、uh, spread out. <laughs> I see you.、Um, So I want you to pay attention to what you're doing right now. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes, and I'm hoping that if you sort of learn to tweak this a little bit, it could significantly change the way your life unfolds.、Um, so we're really fascinated with body language, and we're particularly interested in other people's body language. You know, we're interested in, like, you know,、um, a.、Uh, Uh, an awkward interaction, or a smile, or a contemptuous glance, or maybe a, a very awkward wink,、um, or maybe even something like a handshake. Here they are arriving at number ten, and、uh, look at this lucky policeman gets to shake hands with the president of the United States. Oh, and here comes the prime minister of it. No. <laughs> So、um, a handshake or the lack of a handshake can have us talking for weeks and weeks and weeks. Even the BBC and the New York Times. So, so obviously, when we think about nonverbal behavior or body language, but we call it nonverbals as social scientists, it's language. So we think about communication. When we think about communication, we think about interactions. So, what is your body language communicating to me? What's mine communicating to you? And there's a lot of reason. To, be- to-, to believe that this is this is a valid way to look at this. So social scientists have spent a lot of time looking at the effects of of our body language or other people's body language on judgments, and we make sweeping judgments and inf- inferences from body language, and those judgments. Can predict really meaningful life outcomes, like who we hire or promote,、um, who we ask out on a date. For example.、Uh, Uh, Nalini Ambadi, a researcher at Tufts University, shows that when people watch 30-minute,、uh, 30-second soundless clips of real physician-patient interactions, their judgments of the physician's niceness predict whether or not that physician will be sued. So it doesn't have to do so much with whether or not that physician was incompetent, but do we like that person and how they interacted?、Um, even more dramatic, Alex Todorov at Princeton is.